we are going to spend until um, mid-August talking about the Lord's Prayer, and today we're going to talk about one portion of the Lord's Prayer, but let's read it for full context, okay? All right, I'm reading out of the NIV. Thank you, Aaron. He sends me good texts about the NIV. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be already. Some of you are already just saying it like you did in, in Catholic school, right? You're already going on with it. That's good. There's no problem with that. I was Catholic till I was eight. Then I was an atheist, and now I'm charismatic Pentecostal. So that's a wild journey for all of us as well. Uh, this, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's talk about some big picture elements of this prayer. And um, then we'll get into the your kingdom come up portion of the prayer, which is obviously if you, one of my favorite parts of all of scripture. If you don't know, you know, that is what we literally titled the church after. So it, it means a great deal to me because of its impact. But Jesus says when talking to um, followers, when talking to the religious, when talking to spiritual seekers, he says the phrase, uh, this is how you should pray. What I love about this is he actually gives a formula. How many people in here are like systematic in their brain and they need a process and, a, and like a formula? Put your, now you're lying. Put your hand down, Rich. Okay, just me and Seth and Julie and Kristen. Thank you. Now, now we're starting to get a little free by raising our hands. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, what I love about this is Jesus gives us a, a flow. Oftentimes in scripture, prayer is this ambiguous thing often talked about, but it seems so unattainable. And we, we see it, and it may, maybe the Bible's like that because there's so many different expressions of prayer, and we don't want to pigeonhole anything, right? Even though we do kind of pigeonhole uh, types of prayer, depending on what church crew you're, you're hanging around with. But that's for another conversation at another time. Um, he says, this is how you should pray. In fact, Jesus also taught the—we don't need that yet, Millie— you just let the cat out of the bag. We now got to start over. I'm just kidding. Um, you can keep it up there because it's a big thing anyway. Millie's trying to figure out how to take it off now. Now we're stuck in the purgatory of slides. Okay. So um, what was I saying before? Remind me what I was saying. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he teaches about the Lord's Prayer. And then he also teaches about the Lord's Prayer a second time. The disciples are observing him praying. And they're seeing him in his secret place, but this time a physical place with God. And the disciples go, hey, do you think you can teach us to pray like you pray? And he goes, sure, pray like this. And so that's not the same time. That's not the same place. It's two totally different times, but Jesus uses this formula. Now, when I say formula, I know when we think of the Lord's Prayer, my Catholic grandmother or... Um, I don't know what she would classify. My agnostic, atheist, Catholic grandmother um, knows the Lord's Prayer, and she can repeat it in the proper King James Version, and uh, she doesn't even, you know, she could quote it, and she knows it. In fact, when we talked about I, the church name with her, I used her as a, um, as, a, as a guinea pig to see what she thought, and she obviously loved it because, you know, she remembers the Lord's Prayer. And... Um, I love, I, what I love about Catholicism and other, um, like, orthodox type of movements is their liturgy. I love their repeating of prayers, and I think we just look at that and go, ugh, and then we want to just pray in tongues for an hour, which is wonderful and great, too. I love the whole collection of all the types of prayer that is actually in Scripture. Remember, Jesus says, my house, the Lord says, my house will be a house of prayer. That word's translated four times, intercession, intercession supplication, liturgy, and worship. That's what, if you define, look what the four, the prayer word in Hebrew is, it's that, those four types of prayer. So I enjoy it. I love it. Um, the, the negative side of beautiful liturgy is that often we can just think it's some um, religious poem we sang or we've taught or has been kind of ingrained into us, and we can lose the beauty of what's actually being said. Um, Gary Wilson has, text, has been texting me a lot of scriptures, random scriptures, and um, like very random, but he just texts me anyway, and I just give him a good heart because I love them. And Gary has said, I've just been coming like with this awakening 
of, of the word. He's like, every time I'm reading scripture, it's like coming alive within me. It's like what Jeremiah said, like a fire shut up in my bones when Jeremiah said, I want to devour, I want to feast on your words. And so um, I think when we can get into that, a lot of us maybe in our upbringing have read this prayer and just looked at it as a nice, cute little thing that Jesus meant we're supposed to literally pray the prayer. Well, yes, sure, Jesus would love for you to literally pray the prayer. That's wonderful. But I also think what gets lost is the character of, of God in the prayer. So before we spend a whole month talking about it, I'm going to get to the kingdom come portion of it. I want to give us the big picture, and I want us to, to kind of get out of our heads that it's not just the little liturgy we pray, which you can. It's wonderful. It's great. That's how I pray most mornings. I just read scripture to God out loud. That's most of my prayer time is that or either praying in the spirit. Those literally are the, like the two main vehicles in which I pray. So it's wonderful. I don't want to minimize it. Um, this Frederick Buechner, he's a theologian I know nothing about. So if you Google him and find things you don't like, I just saw this quote in a book and know nothing about him. Okay, so don't send me any text or emails, please. I don't know anything about this man other than this quote. Okay, good. Did I cover my bases? Okay. He said this, we do well not to pray the Lord's prayer lightly. It takes guts to pray it all. To speak those words is to invite the tiger out of the cage, to unleash a power that makes atomic power look like a warm breeze. Wow. When I read that a time ago, I went, maybe I need to look at this prayer again because I've just been doing it. Our, I've just been doing like our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom. Come. Oh, I'm like, I don't feel a tiger being unleashed, right? And uh, Millie, if you would, always on time, Millie. There you go. That's my girl. Let's, um, it, let's look at this. It's going to be hard to see. At one point before I retire, there will be bigger screens, I would imagine. Uh, but for now, this is where we are. I want you to look at, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this, but I want, this is me. This is just my mind. I could be wrong. But I, in the bold, I believe is a character, a heart of the Father that's representative on the left side portion of prayer. Does that catch, does that make sense? So I want you guys to see this for the big picture, okay? So when we talk about our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, it's literally, who are we speaking to? Dad, Abba. This is now identity as I call Father I can call him father because now I am identifying as a son or a daughter. So the very first part of this prayer is just proper identification as a son or a daughter, right? If Madison and Levi say, hey, dad, they don't say, hey, Matt. They call me because they identify as my daughter and my son. So the very first portion of this prayer is actually really beautiful. It's identity, which Joe leaned into. We've really been leaning into um, in our walk with the Lord. And then hollow be your name or holy be your name um, is really like preeminence, which is superiority, which is, hey, you're set apart. So father, hey, father, hey, dad, I'm acknowledging now, oh, you are set apart. You are sovereign. You are holy, right? Not big you and little me, but I'm understanding your place, your authority, who you are. And then now I'm saying, hey, your kingdom come. So this is now, hey, dad, I see who you are. It's been thundering and raining every day for three weeks. Kayla hasn't noticed and it's been driving me nuts. The, the, so we go, it's literally been every day every single into my world and my life. So now this is the union prayer. Now, hey, big sovereign God coming into the day-to-day -day of my life, letting your will be done. Yours, we're following his will, following the leader, submitting to his plans. Your will be done. Not what Matt thinks, right? And then on earth as it is in heaven, but now we're co-laboring together. We're moving like the Lord wants us to move because he is not actually here on earth. He is in his realm and Jesus is not here on earth. He is next to God in God's realm. And the only one of the triune God that is here on earth is the one that's dwelling in us. In us. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Give us today our daily bread is provision spiritually and, and physically, I mean practically, to us and others. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors is reconciliation not only to the Father, but restoration to others, the loving people type of the commandment, and lead us not into tem to, to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, um, is refinement, 
through his love. So look at those things on the right side. So identity, preeminence, union, following or submission, co-laboring, provision, reconciliation, refinement. These are way deeper than us just repeating a prayer and being done in 10 seconds. Jesus himself was showing us the heart of the Father himself through how we should pray, not just what we say, it really goes deeper than that, but how we should be living the realities in which we're, we're living. Thank you, Joe. You guys will be looking at me kind of confusing today, but that's okay. We have to get, we'll get it and we'll understand. And it's okay. Um, okay. So the word kingdom, let's just do a quick refresher because we talked about this a lot, does not mean a place and it does not mean heaven. Anywhere in the Bible you see kingdom does not mean a physical place and does not mean heaven. It means the rule and reign of God. So when you see kingdom anywhere, it means the rule and reign of God. The kingdom has come near, Jesus said. Not a place, it was a person, Jesus, and the rule and reign of God. So we can really think of it like the kingdom came, comes, and it's coming. Like in, in, that, whole, in, that, whole, in that whole flow. Like the kingdom is now... The rule and reign of God. I'm not going to say rule and reign of God now because that's annoying and it's too long, kingdom shorter. So I'm going to say kingdom now, but don't trip out and think of a place. Um, but the kingdom is, is now and also not, not fully yet. And so Matthew 6.10 says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the prayer we're going to lean into. So when Jesus is saying these words, what we're saying is this prayer is a reality for now and in the future. This prayer is partnership now, but also a prophetic hope of what's to come. This is why I love the prayer so much, because it's for me today, but while I'm also praying it, I'm prophetically standing in with the Lord with the hope of what's coming. And that, to me, is exciting. Now, remember our aim at what's coming. So when we see the kingdom coming, we're not talking about us graduating to heaven. We're not talking about, I live a mundane life, and I die of old age, and then I graduate to heaven, and finally I'll be with Jesus. No, no, no. That, we're not talking about graduation to heaven. And we're not talking about whatever your eschatology your end times beliefs are. We're not talking about this reign, that. Jesus is coming back, and the end game is the new heaven and the new earth. Here. So that, so whatever, whatever flavor you want on the timeline, you can take it up with the flavor, please. I look at just the hope, the hope of glory is Jesus comes back, and at some point, new heavens and new earth here. Not in the sky. Here. Gidget, easy now. Do you need some water, my dear? Okay. Amen. It's not the same when chastity isn't here. Amen. We're picking on a sister. We're not condemning or laughing. That's all that it is. Thank you very much. Okay. So you, you guys catch my drift. Okay. Um, and so this is a prayer for now, but a prayer also of, of what's coming and what's exciting. And it's exciting. And I want to just add a little nuggerino. If you are afraid of death, uh, if you're worried about death, if you're worried about separation from family, if you're worried about all those things, I understand it's a very real thing. Like, I, I'm not minimizing it. And you might be saying, easy for you to say, I'm at the dapper age of 34. Some of you are older. I totally understand. But uh, two years ago, when I started learning about the new heaven and new earth, it basically took my fear of death completely away. And it, it, I'm like genuinely, because I would think about if I'm driving down the road and somebody hits me, you know, it was kind of nonstop of thoughts of I really felt like I was going to die prematurely, like, you know, at some early point of my life. Um, I just have always been, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But when I started really learning about the new heaven and the new earth, it's brought me so much joy, so much comfort. We t are teaching Madison this as well. Uh, we've had a dog that died. We've had a couple family members that die. And, um, and she gets the, she understands the the reality that there's going to be a reunion that's going to be on earth doing fun things that she likes to do with them. You know, we, we, we are fascinated over, oh, we're not going to be married anymore. 
I always took that. That's, again, coming from fear. Oh, I'm not going to be married to Kayla. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm married to Jesus. Yay. Guess what? I might not be married to her in documentation. I'm going to be with her for eternity. Kayla and I will be able to literally be on the new heaven and new earth with my family and some of you, right, doing the things still. We might not be married in the sense of what we are today, but we're still going to be together. And I went, oh, wait, I'm not going to be a prisoner in my house, and Kayla's a prisoner in her house, and their prisoner was over there, all, and we're just singing holy, holy, holy all day, 24-7, married to Jesus. Like, what the heck? No, wait a minute. This is the way. And I'm like, okay. It, 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 was, it brought so much hope and peace to me uh, moving forward. So that's the hope of glory that we're talking about, okay? Whatever your eschatology is, just take it and shut. I'm just kidding. (laughs) So let's invite the tiger out of the cage, all right? Let's invite the tiger out of the cage. The kingdom come prayer, you guys ever went to the LSU games? Back when I went to LSU, they actually brought Mike around. They don't anymore. Probably cancer culture thing or something. I don't know. Oh, COVID. Oh, yeah, even better. COVID. Um, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I'm sure COVID. The tiger had COVID? He could spread COVID? Oh, okay, okay. So, was, oh, thank you. And COVID. I like the COVID answer better. So, that's the one I'm going to choose to believe because I like it better. Um, but when Mike would go around the uh, go around and they put the artificial roar in the speakers and their speakers were really bad at that stadium back at, when I was there. Um, but let's unleash the tiger out of the cage. Uh, this is what I think. Uh, this is what I think. What I want us to lean into the kingdom come prayer um, resuscitates his body back to life and purpose, which has been hijacked by the thief. So I think the the kingdom come prayer resuscitates his body, who is us, back to life and purpose and fulfillment. But why does he have to resuscitate it? Because it's been hijacked by the thief in John 10. So scripture says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Okay. Scripture says we then are the body of Jesus. Scripture says, then we as the body are now Jesus's ambassadors and also being the very dwelling place of God himself. We don't understand the magnitude of that. It's a wonderful mystery. But it's a scriptural reality that Jesus is the image of the invisible... The Father created man and female in Father, Son, and Spirit's image. And he made us into this. This was the design he chose. That's why the glorified body will not be one with wings and looking like a bird. and It'll be a glorified version of this. This was the DNA blueprint. You want to know what your glorified body will be like? Just look at when Jesus was resurrected. He looked like this. But he also could travel through walls and time. We always said, Aaron's going to pop in and we're cultivating the garden. He's going to pop in and go, well, bam! Just as he comes through, just as he, that's all he's going to do. That's all he's going to spend his whole time is just doing that, just surprising people. Well, bam! All that, like, I I already, I actually know it. So we'll, yeah, yeah, I I know, I know. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to laugh greatly. I'm going to laugh greatly. And then, and then. I can't say anything. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to laugh greatly. I'm going to laugh greatly at you. So um, this is the body he chose to make human beings in his image. Well, then here's something really wild. God himself chose this body, Jesus' body, to be the image of himself. Okay? So Jesus came in the form of a human being body. So the image of God is now looked to Jesus who looked like a human being because he was God and man, right? Then Jesus goes, Holy Spirit comes, and now the only representation left on earth is the body. We are the body. So we are the Father Son, and Holy Spirit on the earth. 
listen, that sounds wild, that sounds presumptuous and arrogant, but it's the reality. It's wildly in intimidating, yet really exhilarating. The Father is in his space with Jesus at the right hand. They gave Holy Spirit, who would give heaven in us as a dwelling place to now be Jesus and God on earth, on their behalf. So when we speak, it's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we're reconciling Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Kayla needed, a, Kayla needed a hug on last Wednesday. I mean, I hugged Kayla, obviously, but this was like a, a hug hug. And it wasn't weird. It wasn't weird because we didn't make it weird. So you might not know the actual context of this, so it might sound weird to you. But it wasn't weird in this little prayer room. And I went over to her, and I, and I just felt the Lord tell me that when I hug her, when I hug her as the body of Christ— that she is going to feel the Father's embrace. Not even like it's her husband hugging her, but like it's the Father hugging her, using my body to hug and comfort my wife. I hugged her. It was probably the longest hug we ever had. We didn't say anything about it. I didn't say, this is God hugging you. <laughs> like, I just, I just did it. I just did it. And, and go into, you always got to go in the deeper voice for God's voice, right? Still small voice, but yet it's really deep. Yeah, weird. Um, and so... Afterward, I said, hey, can I just tell you something I felt about the hug? And she had said the, the whole thing. She's like, I literally felt as if it was the Father hugging me, and even though it was your physical body. And so um, as wild as this might be, these are the, the realities that we step into. Let me give you my last quote. Rich gives 10. I'm going to go down to just two. Rich, give, I'm going to hit the, 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 two, the two historians. Uh, this is St. Teresa. I know nothing about her other than this quote. It was from the 1500s, and I was in, it was in the book John Marcoma wrote, Christ has no body on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassionately on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Christ has no body on earth, no body on earth uh, but yours. Remember, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember, okay, you guys, you guys catch what I'm saying? It's not heresy, I promise you. It's genuine scripture. But there are some who think it's heresy, and they're the thieves. The thief thinks this is heresy. So the thief in John chapter 10 has always wanted to paralyze the body. The thief in John 10 has always wanted to make it immovable, has always wanted to make it dysfunctional, has always wanted to make the left leg go this way. Have you guys ever tried walking? Like, really, like the left leg wants to do this and the right this, and I'll just try and walk. I won't do it because I'll embarrass myself, right? But it's a funny adventure, right? He, the, the thief has always wanted to uh, control or paralyze the body. He's always wanted to add conditions. He's always wanted to add conditions and control the flock. And the thief in John 10 has masqueraded his voice to want to sound like the Lord's. And ultimately, this is what Scripture says in John 10, 10 about the thief, that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Um, last week, I've realized that I've been lied to my whole life. That's, that happens once a month. Um, it's okay. I thought the thief this whole time was Satan, and that is a, a lie. I thought the thief was Satan, because everyone says, and Satan's come to steal, kill, and destroy. So I just read the nine verses before it in a coffee shop and said, no, I just read the scriptures before, and then I researched the word thief. It's in 16 other places in the New Testament. It's never talking about Satan or the enemy. You know who the thief's talking about? The religious leaders, the Pharisees. Look at John 10, verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep gate, the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and is a robber. The thief that's come to steal, kill, and destroy is, was the religious system and the religious leaders. So it's better translated, the religious system and leaders come to steal, kill, and destroy. 
But I, Jesus, have come. This is the upside down kingdom. Want to steal, kill, and destroy? Yes, yes. But from an actual John 10, 10 scriptural context, he, the enemy does want to steal, kill, and destroy and other things. But in this context, Jesus is saying, no, it's the religious leaders and the religious system of the day. Now, the enemy, the accuser, Satan, Lucifer, whatever name, Jamoke that you want to call him, I call him Jamoke. It's an Italian slang word that you can Google later. It's kind of harsh. That's why I just say Jamoke. Um, the Jamoke, the enemy, has not wanted to, and I say this so often, has not wanted to kill your faith. Let me pause again and tell you why I'm telling you these things. The kingdom come prayer takes what the enemy has tried to immobilize and bring it back to life. So let's look at the why this has been immobilized. So he's wanted, the, the enemy and the accusers wanted to kill your faith. His plan has always been, read scripture, to use those in spiritual power or authority. The enemy rarely used in scripture anyone who wasn't in spiritual power or authority. Adam and Eve were given authority, and he deceives Adam and Eve. Um, Noah was given authority, the only righteous one. And his son, shaming him, tried to literally throw the whole thing in the water, pun intended, but it didn't work. When he tried to have Moses battle shame and guilt for murdering and hiding, Moses overcame the shame and guilt, but there was Aaron, his brother, who when they went up to hear the voice of God, came down and Aaron said, cool, these, these golden idols are great. I didn't know what you wanted me to do with these people, Aaron said, because he was coming in through deception, through spiritual power and authority. Look at all the kings, look at all the judges, all through the Old Testament. He came through, the enemy comes in, not the thief, the enemy. There's a thief and there's the enemy. The enemy is the jamoke, the thief is the religious leaders, okay? I think back to Jeremiah, he lulled the priests and prophets to sleep. Jeremiah 6.13 says, or Jeremiah 2, excuse me, says that you teach and you prophesy, yet you don't know anything about me. And Jeremiah 6.13 says, so you're frauds, talking to the priests and prophets. And God himself charged the second exile. He literally exiled Israel because of the spiritual authorities and the spiritual leaders. And then during Jesus' times, whose eyes did the accuser, the enemy, blind? The religious. So who did Jesus call? The ones on the water, the ones collecting taxes, the ones who had no power or authority. But the ones who were most aggressive were the thieves. So the enemy uses those in spiritual power and authority, whether intentionally or not, intentionally or not from those people, to keep the body, to keep the body stifled. It's why if you read most of the New Testament, apart from the Gospels, it's about letters to pastors, those in the fivefold, churches, followers of Jesus, that's like, there's this new teaching. Stand firm. This is the gospel. This is like they're corralling and shepherding. Be careful. Be careful. Remember what we said. Remember what you said because there was so much deception happening to rob these people of being the body of Christ. So much was happening that the enemy wanted to dismember the body of Jesus piece by piece where the body would be paralyzed where the body would be paralyzed. He's not trying, the enemy does not want to make you an atheist. You need to hear very closely. He does not want to make you an atheist, okay? And once you have an encounter with the Lord, it's impossible really to become an atheist again. Now, other types of things, sure. But he doesn't want to make you an atheist. His main aim is to destroy your confidence that you have as a son or daughter in Christ. And when your confidence and your misidentity, not as a son or daughter in Christ, takes place, we're paralyzed. But yet, if we're confidently walking and confidently speaking on the authorities given as a son or as a daughter, our, the body of Christ begins moving at wild and beautiful rates where heaven's realities 
now become very normalized uh, on the earth. And over year, the years, he's not done this through government officials. He's not done this through the presidential person you don't like. He's not done this through different policies or high influential atheists. He's done this through your pastors, your Sunday school teachers, your denominational leaders. He's done this through the churches that you've attended. He's done this through your mother, your grandmother, and whatever other bad theology they've taught you about God. That's what he's done. That's what he's done to get the body to be paralyzed anymore. It's a beautiful prayer. So many of us have come to faith. I, I, want, you, I want to still lean in here because many of us have come to faith afraid. We've come to faith afraid. You're going to go to hell, so you have to come to the Lord so you don't go to hell. What's wild to me is we often come to faith in fear versus love. When Scripture says that God is love and also that it's his loving kindness that leads us, right? I don't remember being lovingly kind. I don't remember his kindness lovingly me bringing me into his kingdom. I don't remember the heart of God and the grace of God bringing me or anyone that I would know around 10 years ago into the kingdom. What I do remember was I didn't want to burn to death, and that scared me. And so I wanted then to be saved. I didn't love Jesus. I loved the idea of not going to hell. And then they make you repeat a prayer that's not in Scripture. The sinner's prayer is not in Scripture. They make you repeat a prayer so that you know that you're good. They hand you a Bible, and they say, Good luck. Now come to all the things on the church calendar. But good luck. So you go home and you mean well. I don't want to go to hell. And I've said the prayer. Okay. I read Exodus for a minute and that's weird. So let me go to John. And in the beginning was the, and we say John's the easy thing to understand. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Yeah, okay. So is there anything easier than this? And then I'm reading, and now I'm an idiot because I don't understand it. But I go to church the next day, and everyone's flopping like a fish, and they seem like they enjoy it. So I go back home, and I'm reading, and I, like, I still don't understand. And then I'm going to somebody who gave me the Bible. Could you explain to me things about Scripture? No, just read. The Holy Spirit will tell you. Just read. What is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? Uh, okay, so let me, let me go back and read. And all the while, I'm still doing my sin behaviors. I'm still looking at pornography. I'm still doing all the awful things. I'm, so, I'm also giving an imp, it's a place into my life when I was in my early 20s. I'm doing all the things. So I'm angry. I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. Uh, I'm not understanding the Bible, but I repeated a prayer, and I'm still going to church, and now I'm going on the Wednesday, on the Tuesday, on the whatever, on the whatever, on the whatever, on the whatever. All the while, things don't seem like they're getting better. Well, everyone around me says, just wait, just tarry. Things will get better. Jesus will come, and he'll take you out of this awful world. And just wait. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And I'm like, that doesn't bring me great comfort, because right now, like, tomorrow, I'm in need of him. Just read your Bible. Have you been reading your Bible? Yeah. But I haven't been understanding. Well, have you been praying? Yeah. Like, how have you been praying? Lord, give me a good day today. I'm confused. Like, that, that's my prayer. Okay, that's a good place to start. And then we hear about, like, the local church, right? So you just got to get funneled into everything, and then you have to be at everything, and God forbid that you don't come because your kid has a school activity, and now you're banished to hell because you missed coming the fourth time that week because your kid had softball on Sunday. But we've been told softball is the devil. We've been told church activities on, on Wednesday is the devil. We'd be told you can't, it's either choose youth group or choose your sports activity. Every kid in America wants a sports activity, and now we're condemned to hell. That's what we've been told, right? And they look at us with their little finger. And, and we start going through the whole thing, and we're like, wow, the thief is on display today. So we show up. We go through the mechanisms of church. We sing the songs on the screen. We don't know what we're singing, but they're singing it loudly, so we just sing it so we don't look like we don't even know what they're saying. The buckets go by, and we throw in $6, and... Um, we then shortly realize that the more holy ones who understand, they're the ones who get to do the things. 
So they're the ones on the platform. They're the ones speaking because they're the holier ones. They understand. They must understand the Bible. So then we're infiltrated in from a very, very early, but I just don't want to go to hell. And then I go to a church where everybody has a good time on Sunday for a little while, but then I'm still very confused when I leave and, and when I go. And then what begins to start happening is you come to church long enough and you realize people start disappearing. And you don't see sister so-and-so and brother Houdini anymore. They're gone. Just as quick as they came, they're gone. And you start at, <laughs> and you start, to, we're going to be here longer, by the way, so just, yeah, it's okay. And, and just, as, just as that settles in, you might want to text the kids. Somebody text Brandon and say, we're going to be longer, Rich or Jamie or somebody. Kayla and Maddie are over there, so they should be able to handle it. Um, just as it settles in, just as it settles in, we start seeing people go. So we go to Brother Houdini and Sister Sally. That, that doesn't rhyme with Houdini. And we, and we look at them and say, oh, I've not seen you at church. Oh, yeah, yeah. I go to a different church now. Oh, really? Yeah, the music's just a little bit better. Oh, wait, that's what it, and then we realize that actually what's happened is we've walked into fast food restaurant chain with a church logo on the building, and we've realized that instead of the faith community that I desperately was seeking, the eternity of man is, on, is in my heart, I'm seeking faith community, but I've been told that I've got to escape from hell, given a Bible I don't understand, nobody helped me read it, and then I'm coming to church and people are disappearing. And I'm getting a little bit confused because this doesn't feel like faith family. And so we play hopscotch. Oh, this one's got the better music. But the preaching stinks. I've heard that one, so that, that's why I talk from experience. Okay, well, over there the preaching's better, but oh, gosh their music's awful. Oh, this one's shorter. If I had a dollar for every time that somebody didn't want to be here because the length of service, our million-dollar building would be half paid off. (laughs) And I start realizing, when was it about you? I don't understand. When did we think this is Burger King or McDonald's? Are you in the family of faith or are we in consumerism Christianity? And this is, the, this is the thief. This is the enemy. Hold up just a second. I'm a little confused. So I go, and then when the, when the chefs in the kitchen leave, everything you went to that church for, I guess, is thrown out the window because now they've got a new chef. I've got to go somewhere else. I don't re- read anything about church hopping in, like, New Testament. That's weird. I, I don't. I don't. It's just strange to me that they were literally in homes, living life together, and none of them went, I'm going to the the Pharisaical temple now because you didn't give me your hash browns today. (laughs) I don't don't understand. I don't understand. And what has happened is we've been hypnotized into thinking this is normal by the accuser and the thief. We've been hypnotized, literally. If you're offended by what I'm saying, it's because there's some deep part of you that believe what I'm saying. And I believed what I was saying. And when you see it, you can't unsee it. So this is who we are now. You can't unsee it. When you see it, you can't unsee it. And it charges you. To want, it just charges you in everything that, you're, everything that you're doing. So I love days like this where we're gathering together. There's still a place for it. The New Testament believers, they gathered in homes. They gathered together. They worship. Corinthians says, you brought something here today, not your money, what you brought here. But intentionally or unintentionally, the thieves over time have been lulled into a trance to keep our, the body paralyzed to only get a temporary reprieve on Sunday morning. Do you remember when Saul was being so tormented by demons that he'd want David to play, not to deliver him, to soothe the de- tormenting demons? He didn't say, play to deliver me. He said, play that the demonic will be soothed. And a lot of times, that's what today has become, where we're soothing, we're soothing, but you're going home today and tomorrow, and your life is not matching up to what you felt today. And there's a part of that 
There's a part of that that's a process and journey, but it's because there's been an intended attack on you to keep you at a place where you were not living in Christ. Maybe in church, but not in Christ. And he wants you to live in Christ. So this is what the enemy and the thief are frightened of, that you and I begin walking as the body walks. And you know what he's frightened about? The enemy's frightened because what it'll mean for his kingdom and influence. And the thief, the religious leaders are frightened because what it'll mean for their kingdom, their churches, and their influence with other church leaders and denominations and numbers and successes. Yet, I've been so confronted by 1 John chapter 2, 5 through 7, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know, this is how we know we are in him. So it's not a repeated prayer. How do I know that I'm, that I'm in God, that I'm saved, restored? It's not a repeated prayer. Go to the next, Millie. Millie, there we go. This is how we know we're in him, in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. There's your sinner's prayer. How you know that you're in him and abiding and remaining and resting and dwelling is if we live as Jesus did. That doesn't, that used to sound intimidating, but it doesn't quite sound as intimidating anymore because he's not asking us to be the Messiah. He's asking us to live in the beauty and the majesty and how, and how he lived. And it's not hard. It's not striving. It's not actually doing more. It's being comfortable in knowing who you are. Knowing who you are. And there are things that need to be worked out and restored, no doubt, journeys and processes. But the Lord lives in you. You are good. And he loves you. You are good. Oh, but I did this deal. We'll work through. That's, you are good. You are good. You are good. You are good. You are loved. The kingdom come prayer is walking in heaven's realities on earth. So your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember, the kingdom is here and not yet fully realized yet. And the Father uses the body. I'm looking at a bunch of bodies. The Father uses the body to bring heaven's realities on earth. The Father uses you and me to bring the realities of heaven on earth. Remember what I've said like a year ago. We're never responsible for the outcome. We're always responsible for the obedience. We're never responsible for the outcome. There's a mystery of God, a wild mystery of God. I can go with you to the who, what, when, where, why this, why that, why that. Oh, trust me. Kayla and I are going through something. right. I've, we've asked the why question a lot. We've turned the why into Thanksgiving, but, or I've turned the why into Thanksgiving, and she's trying to get there. But what, we're, what we, we understand is not his plan and his outcomes, but just stepping into things that Jesus himself did. Let me give you a, a baseline. You guys are out from the fall. Yeah, go, <laughs> there it was. Do you have the next, uh, the new thing I had, we had put in, Millie? Or however she put it in? Okay, is that all of them? Did she put them all on one slide? Okay, so I'm missing some. These are all just for my brain in Scripture, but I know I'm missing some, so don't pigeonhole me on this. So if we are to bring heaven's realities to earth, what are heaven's realities? So where God is right now, what's happening? Well, it's the presence of God's there, intimacy and union with God, unfailing and unending love. There's beauty and majesty happening in creation and nature. There is physical healing in new bodies, wholeness and mental restoration. What else do we have? There's no sin, no evil, no death, no sickness. There's community with others, laboring and cultivating with jobs, 
worshiping, eating, and drinking with others, ruling and reigning with him and one another. So these are actually heaven's realities. I will definitely shrink part of my late message now to tell you this existed on the earth before in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, you can keep those up the whole time now, Millie. These realities were on earth in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, there was no plan of death. There was not they were just going to die. The, a plan was this on earth fully, and that Adam and Eve were supposed to be fruitful and multiply, which they did, minus the whole fruit incident, but they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply, and we would all be living forever and ever with all of these realities on earth. And then sin came. We know the story. Jesus comes as the second Adam through his life, death, burial, and resurrection to restore what was lost in the garden. So he restores what's lost in the garden. So now, now on earth, we can have access to these things now and also not fully known. Do we have new glorious bodies right now? No, no. Does everyone we pray for get physically healed? No. Is there physical healing? Yes, right? There's still the mystery of all things that have not fully come into restoration. When the new heaven and new earth come, we are now back living here in this paradigm and here in this reality and in this sweet spot. So what does this mean for us? What reality are you living out daily as the body on earth? What reality from the list you don't have to just pick one and then do another one the next week. That's not how this works. Are you living out in your day-to-day? -day? So I think about this. So the presence of God is here. He's inside of you. Wonderful. Heaven is inside of you. That realities of heaven are inside of you. Right? Think of intimacy and union with God. It's things that we've been talking about. That's already happened. We are now one in Christ, right? We already have those things. Unfailing and unending love. I won't go down the whole list here. But what are things that, and what are some spots where you are just dropping heaven into your realities? That's Jesus' whole intent. And Jesus on the cross paved the way for where we get to do the exact same thing, right? So there's no more of, oh, this world's so bad, one day I'll leave, I'll fly away, as the old hymn says, right? There's, it, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. One day we get the glorious hope of being together in a new heaven and new earth, and I can't wait till Jesus comes back, Maranatha, let's do the whole thing. But while we're here, while we're here, we're still doing what we're going to be doing, eating together, drinking together, enjoying one another, singing together, cultivating the ground together, working together. Maybe not at your job you're working at now, and definitely not mine, praise the Lord. That will end when prophets, evangelists, there is now. Those now have not stopped ceasing, but until when Jesus in perfection comes. So this is what I'd like to do. The thief, the thief has come to keep these as a fairy tale for you. A fairy tale of not yet. That's what the thieves come to do. And the thieves come to just say, come to more church services, come to the altar more times, keep sowing seeds so you got no more seeds to sow. <laughs> right? They've made the local church God. And I made the local church God. When that's not what the intent of it is to be. So the thief comes right, to keep us paralyzed from these realities. Yet Jesus says, you, my friends, are praying this prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Your heaven's realities are happening now. Now. So for some of you, the greatest thing that you can do to bring heaven to earth is go eat with somebody. I'm not joking. None of us miss meals. Thank you, Aaron. 
I thank you. I know, my. I, I've eaten with you plenty of times. I know you do. Mama Mia. I know. We all like food. Hello? Right? You praying for somebody who needs a physical healing. What if they don't get prayed for? That's okay. Show the love of Jesus with them and just be obedient. It's okay. Just so be obedient. You don't have to give them false hope. You don't have to give them false assurance. Jesus loves you so much. And I'm going to pray over this thing right now that you may be in need of. And we're going to pray and see Jesus on it. Right? Those are the things that we get to do together. So I want to read the prayer one last time, Matthew 6, 10. And I know normally as we close, we always like to, um, we always like to, well, I'm sorry. I like to pray that the Holy Spirit would open your heart. And I always pray Ezekiel 36, 26 often. And that's not a bad thing or anything. Um, I actually don't want to pray right now. And in fact, we're going to read Matthew 6, 10 together, if you actually have it in your Bible, instead of looking at the screen, why don't you look at it, and hopefully yours has red letters. Mine does not, which is disappointing, but Jesus' words. And if you want to unlock and unleash the tiger, you're going to pray this prayer. You don't have to pray it emphatically or loud. Many of you have prayed this prayer to near-death boredom over your life. Near-death boredom. That it's become like John 3.16. John 3.16 is the boringest, boringest thing written in Scripture, yet it's the most wonderful truth in Scripture. But we've been, you know what I mean, when you actually read what's being said. And I don't want you to repeat this prayer or say this prayer if you don't actually mean it in your heart. And no one's going to look at you from a bird's eye view and say they didn't want to repeat the prayer. Oh, no. I wouldn't have wanted to repeat this prayer up until two years ago. But if you want what we've been saying, if you want to come awaken and not lull to sleep anymore, the things that you see that you can't no longer not see? It's a wild thing to ask for. Sometimes I wish for the older times because it was simpler than it seemed. It was very simple then where we thought we can control God because God came into what I wanted. So if I never talked to God and never invited him in but just did things my way that I think he likes, my life's simple because I'm just adding him to things I'm already doing, so it seems like he's there, but when you actually wildly come to a place where you sell and you wouldn't want anything else. So I'm not even going to look at your wonderful faces. You've been so patient today. I'm going to repeat the prayer. We're just gonna, we'll do verse 9 and 10. We'll do verse 9 and 10. And if you want this, in fact, Holy Spirit, as they pray and as I pray, let this be a seal of fire, like a seal of fire, like a fire shut up in our bones, the burning one. Let this be a seal. Let this not be an ordinary prayer. Let this be something that now drives us day to day. Are you guys ready? We'll start at verse 9 in the NIV. This then, you don't have to repeat it like with me, but just pray it where you're at. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here we go. We're unleashing the tiger. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.